1. Chapter 1. Introducing Complicity. Of Sentis of Senshu, Robin Dunford, and Michael New. This book emerged from a conference and subsequent workshop on complicity, and the questions about complicity with which we started remain. Point 1. The two positive conclusions we can offer with confidence are these. First, complicity is a valuable and underestimated tool for the analysis and critique of social relations. Second, it would be a mistake to offer a fixed or rigid definition of complicity, let alone one that we could claim to be objectively correct. Any attempt to establish, once and for all, the nature and scope of complicity would do little more than shut down important avenues for critical analysis, and in so doing, it would detract from our ability to imagine effective resistance against the causes of avoidable harms that can be elucidated through the lens of complicity. Point two, the conceptual exploration and case studies offered in this volume are thus intended to encourage critique and imagination, rather than to offer authoritative pronunciations and abstract analytic truths. In fact, we hope to suggest that there are ways of thinking and writing about complicity which are themselves complicit, particularly if they fail to question the existing political, social, and economic order. Point three. In the next section, on atomistic complicity, we outline an account of complicity according to which law-abiding individuals can walk through life without ever being complicit, as long as they do not break what Thomas Daugherty, in his contribution, calls the law of the land. In the following section, on broadening complicity, we suggest that there are limits to such an account of complicity, and introduce the broader, more critically attentive approach to complicity that unites the chapters in this volume. Through the example of our complicity with wars waged by democratically elected governments, we offer a key argument recurring throughout this book, that reflecting on complicity can operate as a lens through which to understand and recognize our, the editors, authors, readers and many others, role. 2 of Sentis of Sensu et al. In producing and upholding, and hence being complicit in, social structures that have harmful, indeed often fatal, effects. Critically reflecting on such structural complicity suggests that we are sometimes, perhaps often, forced to be complicit. Non-complicity, as Pam Lightman suggests in her chapter, is not always an option. We can be caught in complicity dilemmas, situations in which avoiding one form of complicity results in our becoming complicit in some other way. When confronting a complicity dilemma, however, our thoughts should not simply turn to the question of what is the right thing to do given the miserable circumstances, to which there may be no plausible answer, as hard as we may try to find one, nor should we seek to excuse, justify, or perhaps even, secretly, celebrate the dirty hands we acquire in choosing the least bad option. Rather, such situations should encourage us to think about ways in which we ought to resist, collectively and individually. Ally, the social structures and power relations that force us to be complicit in wrongdoing. The remaining two sections, structural complicity and the question of blame and resistance, complicity dilemmas and anti-complicity, consider these issues in more depth. Throughout this chapter, we also introduce some of the ideas, structural complicity, complicity dilemmas and anti-complicity, that stem from the collective reflections on complicity that have been at the heart of this project. Atomistic complicity. How is the law-abiding citizen said to be able to walk through life without ever being complicit? Well, simply by following the rules, both legal rules, to avoid being complicit in a crime, and moral rules, to avoid being complicit in moral wrongdoing. A complicit act contributes, in some way, to wrongdoing. It facilitates wrongdoing, covers it up, or makes it possible in the first place by creating the conditions which enable it to occur. The assumption that is often made here is that the wrongdoing in question is clearly identifiable, indeed, that the wrongdoer is clearly identifiable. The accomplice knows, or ought to know, in the sense that they can reasonably be expected to know, what they are complicit in, and who they are complicit with. They know, or ought to know, that they are involved in the breaking of a legal and slash or moral rule, and that this is wrong. And thus their being complicit is intentional, or at least reckless or negligent, it is in some way deliberate. The accomplice has chosen to act in a way which contributes to wrongdoing, or they have refrained from acting in a way which would have thrown a spanner in the wrongdoer's works, if, of course, they could reasonably be expected to have done so. There is a tacit assumption here, the accomplice could avoid being complicit and walk through life never failing to avoid it. If they do fail, they share responsibility. Introducing Complicity 3 If not necessarily to the same extent as the main culprit, for the wrong done. They are thus liable to blame, criticism and perhaps punishment. We take this atomistic account of complicity to be a dominant understanding of complicity in the liberal, democratic state. Point four. according to this understanding, complicity is an exclusively individual affair. The focus here is on agency, not structure. The question is not, what structural factors resulted in X being complicit. Nor is it, what sorts of complicities arise, and what sorts of complicity might be unavoidable, when individuals operate and interact in particular social structures. Instead, the question is, what individual, or group of individuals, was complicit with whom in the violation of which rule. From this standpoint, complicity's entire ontological fabric consists of individuals' involvement in breaking either the law, moral principles, or both. It is instructive here to see the example of an instance of complicity offered. By the Oxford English Dictionary, they were accused of complicity in the attempt to overthrow the government. 5. The dictionary does not say, they were accused of complicity in their government's war. Complicity is typically seen as stemming from one's being involved in the breaking of a PA particular law, in a deviation from the existing order, but not in the affirmation or reproduction of the existing order, be it legal, economic, social, or political. 
This reflects a very limited perception of complicity, one that disables critics from making any use of the concept that goes beyond blaming individuals. Depending on the methodological lens through which we look at complicity, however, we will come to recognize different sorts of phenomena, ask different sorts of questions about them and assign different sorts of responsibility. This is precisely what this volume is intended to do. However, we need to issue a warning against declaring a particular meth. Otological approach to be the only epistemic access point for an analysis of complicity. Thinking critically about complicity will be impossible if we keep staring through the same set of lenses, a set that focuses on individual LS, law, blame, and that, as Pam Leitman reminds us in her contribution, has a tendency to look back in time, rather than forward. The contributors to this volume all encourage alternative approaches. Our shared work is not to invalidate the atomistic method introduced above, it is to expose it as too narrow for the specific purpose of social critique, while it can help us attribute blame to individuals, which is often the right thing to do, it cannot enable us to expose structures of complicity in which individuals are forced to be complicit, or can hardly avoid being complicit. As a result, it cannot engage in critique that goes beyond blaming and punishing individuals, the bad apples in Owen Thomas's words, for breaking the law or infringing agreed moral values. What all contributors to this volume agree on is that we must dare to delve deeper when thinking about complicity, even when suspecting, or perhaps for of sentence of sensu et al. Knowing, that what we will unearth beneath these structures is our very own complicity. Only then might we be able to gain a better understanding not only of complicit bad apples, but also of the rotten barrels which contain them, the material and social structures that reproduce complicit individuals and force them to be complicit even when they do not intend to be so, and even if they intend not to be so. We take such reflection to be an important condition of informed resistance. Broadening complicity. The most straightforward thing one can say about complicity is that it consists in the indirect participation of an agent or a group of agents in wrongdoing. Point six. Otherwise, complicity just seems to be wrongdoing full stop, rather than a particular form of it. One can be involved in such wrongdoing through acting or failing to act. A complicit agent is not the main perpetrator of wrongdoing, but at the same time not sufficiently distant from it to be considered uninvolved. If one is complicit, one makes a contribution to wrongdoing, or one fails to prevent wrongdoing from occurring, assuming this is what one could, and should, have done. As soon as we unravel this initial understanding of complicity, however, things become less straightforward. What counts as wrongdoing? Is it a necessary condition of being complicit that one engages in such wrongdoing knowingly? And, perhaps most importantly, is it always possible to avoid being complicit? Consider an example, the complicity of a citizenry in their democratically elected governments waging war on spurious grounds. This is not some fantastical scenario, many of the contributors to, and readers of. This volume are likely to be citizens of a liberal democratic state which rego. Larley engages in such warfare. The 2003 Iraq War, a war in which, as Peter Finn demonstrates, governments became complicit in human rights abuses and violations of international humanitarian law, IHL, is a particularly pertinent example here. If we regularly vote for parties and slash or representatives who have a tendency to vote for rather than against bombing people if and when the opportunity arises, and if this opportunity arises with dramatic frequency, both historically and contemporarily in the case of countries such as the United States and the United Kingdom, then we ought to stop voting for them. It is difficult to see in this case how those who have voted a particular bunch of warmongers into office, let alone those who have a historical record of voting warmongers into office, could plausibly claim not to be complicit, unless they publicly distance themselves from the bombing campaign, and commit never to vote for the warmongers again. Introducing Complicity 5. This is not to suggest that voters can always anticipate these things. It is probably fair to say that German Green Party voters could hardly have foreseen that one of the first moves of the Social Democratic Party, SPD, slash Green Party coalition formed in 1998 would be to take part in the bombing of Serbia during the Kosovo intervention in 1999.7 but would it not then be the responsibility of such voters to withdraw their support immediately? It is not good enough simply to point out that one's voting for a party was not meant to signify one's support for a party's bellicosity, whether well documented or recently discovered, but merely for its stance on ecology, gay marriage, and animal rights. This shows that it is perfectly conceivable for a decent, law-abiding citizen, what else would a Green Party voter be? To be complicit in wrongdoing. And German Green Party voters in 1999 knew, or should have known, that they were being complicit. This leads us to the question of knowledge. An atomistic account of com. Complicity would assume and require that accomplices know, or could reasonably be expected to know, that they are involved in wrongdoing. Similarly, in our example, we have assumed that voters had, or in the case of the German Green Party voters from 1998, were rapidly allowed to gain, relevant knowledge of what was going on, knowledge concerning the past and future policies and practices of the people and parties they were voting in. But what if voters are ignorant, if they simply do not know, or fail to make sense of, the relevant facts? This is a central epistemic question about complicity, the question of whether or not one's knowledge of being involved in wrongdoing, or one's being culpably ignorant about that involvement, is a necessary condition of one's being complicit. Someone's potential to become complicit in wrongdoing appears to require at least some ability to do otherwise. Individually and slash or collectively. A necessary precondition of that ability is. Knowledge. But people often lack this. They may be involved in a lot of wrongdoing and in causing a lot of harm without having the slightest clue that this is the case. 
and yet a state of complete ignorance is almost always a fictional condition, usually conjured when constructing an equally fictional figure, that of a completely unaware social agent. Thus one needs to be wary when confronting refutations of complicity based on grounds of ignorance. Having said that, it is of course often difficult to ascertain whether or not people, including ourselves, know what they are doing, when they are doing what they are doing. We are often unclear about, and slash or unaware of, the direct and slash or indirect consequences of our actions and omissions, let alone about the extent of other people's knowledge about the consequences of their actions and omissions. What is even more difficult to know is whether or not people ought to know, or ought to have known, things they do not, or did not, know. It is frequently the case that people can reasonably be expected to 6 of centus of sensu et al. Know what they do not know, that they are culpably ignorant. Bob Brecker and Michael New claim that Michael Walzer and Alan Dershowitz exemplify this in their writings on torture. It is these authors' culpable ignorance which, according to Brecker and New, constitutes their complicity. Academics are, of course, in a perhaps quite special position of responsibility, they supposedly enjoy academic freedom, they devote their lives to the finding of truth, and they make a living out of their ability to think. For these reasons, they have a responsibility not to buy into the war on terror and not to condone the torture that has accompanied it, but instead to reflect critically upon, and to resist, the way in which this war has been constructed. But what of those who do not enjoy any epistemically privileged position? Can someone be complicit without recognizing their own complicity? Again, we cannot settle these questions, but we can invite readers to join us in reflect. Ing on them. Together, we can then consider the possibility that complicity might not only be a much more complex phenomenon than can be perceived through a lens that looks exclusively at individuals going against the order they inhabit, but might also have value as a heuristic tool for the purpose of social critique. The least that can be said, then, is that just as it should not be taken for granted that law-abiding citizens can walk through life without ever being complicit, so it is also doubtful whether or not the ignorance of those who uphold orders of war can always serve as a legitimate excuse. So far, the example has broadened our horizon of complicity by suggesting that the law-abiding citizen can become complicit, and by problematizing the view that a lack of knowledge about one's being complicit guarantees one's non-complicity. The example has, however, remained within a framework in which reflections on complicity are used to attribute blame to particular individuals, and to think about the forms of action or inaction these individuals would need to take in order to avoid becoming complicit, in this case, not to vote for the warmongers. But what if warmongers are the only parties in town? And what if the situation is so grim that to abstain from voting would inadvertently support the most aggressive of the warmongers, who could have been prevented from coming to power only by lending support to the more moderate warmongers, despicable though they might be? Visualizing such a situation is, once again, hardly an exercise of unrestrained imagination. Consider for a moment how, in the United Kingdom at least, political rhetoric concerning and policies dealing with people other than our own are becoming, among all the parties that have any chance of being elected, increasingly infused with a discourse of securitization. What can the global war on terror be, other than a universal and persistent call to arms? How can politicians who constantly produce, or reproduce, a rhetoric of violence, based on a claimed, but unjustified, need for defense against threats not be visualized as warmongers, 8. Introducing complicity 7. If this analysis is correct, it might be difficult to vote or refuse to vote in a way which avoids complicity in the waging of war. In such a situation, we are faced with a complicity dilemma, a situation in which we cannot but be complicit, and are confronted, on the surface at least, with the choice of being complicit in different wrongs, but in any case in wrongs. After all, even a decision to vote for smaller, anti-war parties, or to spoil one's ballot in an attempt to express one's rejection of all the options available, may serve only to allow the most aggressive warmongers to form a government. One does not need to be an intentionally war-supporting voter to be complicit here. To know that the party one votes for consists of a bunch of warmongers, or that the party one helps allow in by not voting, ballot spoiling, or voting for an anti-militaristic party that stands no chance of winning, seems to be a sufficient condition of complicity. The point here is not to suggest a particular way forward, especially if that way forward is to embrace our dirty hands on the basis that, since we will always be complicit regardless of how we proceed, we have a responsibility to go for the least bad option. Point nine, quite the contrary. It is to show that complicity can operate as a lens through which we can reflect critically on broader power relations and social structures that force one to be complicit. When non-complicity is not an option, it is imperative that we think about the collective practices of resistance that might enable us to challenge these power relations and social structures, and hence develop forms of anti-complicity, a point strongly made in Reynolds's and Daugherty's contributions. Point 10. Structural complicity and the question of blame. Voters have agency, they make decisions, and they can regret their decisions and vote differently in the future, though, as we have seen, not necessarily in a way which enables them to avoid being complicit. But can one also be complicit simply by being structurally positioned in a way which makes one, however inadvertently, contribute to wrongdoing? The epistemic question immediately resurfaces, does an agent's lack of knowledge about their being structurally positioned so as to be involved in wrongdoing make any difference in terms of whether or not they are to be considered complicit? Should complicity be seen, exclusively or at least predominantly, as an individual and deliberate affair? Or as one that is, more often than not, collective, shared, structural and inadvertent? Let us think about war again, not in terms of voting but in terms of contributing to wars by paying taxes. 
whether or not one opposes one's govern. Ments war policy, one cannot help but pay for it. Paying taxes is a practice. One cannot easily refuse to comply with, unless one is prepared to accept. 8 of centus of sensu et al. Death, we live in a world where the basics needed to keep going, such as food, shelter, and clothing, tend to be taxed. The question is, when does paying taxes cease to be a matter of legitimate compliance, and turn instead into an instance of complicity? When people vote, or not, as well as when they pay taxes, they have an impact on the lives of others, both inside and, often with lethal consequences, outside the boundaries of the state in which they live. People are not just hovering atoms in the moral universe, they are bound together, and often also placed in opposition to one another, within the social structures that they inhabit. Their lives are full of externalities, they affect auth ERS, and are affected by others, across time and space. The atomistic account of complicity fails to acknowledge this. To use Paul Reynolds's language, accusations of complicity often operate in relation to exceptional events. Rather than normal practices, such as paying taxes. One of our aims in this book is to open up complicity to the realm of well-established practices that produce wrongdoing, s, by reflecting on how we might be complicit in such practices, and how we can challenge our being complicit, both intellectually and as a matter of practice. Sometimes moral agents can find themselves confined within a complex social structure that hinders them from being the sorts of critical, autonomous, and attentive agents they have the potential to be, or at least the potential they would have had at some point in the past. As Reynolds suggests, reflecting on complicity within complex social structures can enable one to use it as a lens through which to develop structural forms of critique, but to do so without losing sight of the role that individual agents play in reproducing, legitimizing and supporting these structures. Looking at the Iraq War through the lens of complicity reveals a multitude of war-supporting, war-waging, and war-representing agents, whether MEM, bears of parliament, people who had voted them into office, and happily did so again in later elections, weapons manufacturers who benefited financially, private military companies of the kind discussed in Finn's chapter, opportunistic journalists serving the Murdoch Empire, taxpayers who enabled the war to be paid for, and even, according to Nicolette Barsdorf-Liebchen, those voyeurs who represent and normalize the violence of war. There is no doubt that, in the United Kingdom, Tony Blair played a crucial part within this complex web of complicity, and yet he was only one among many. Examining all this through the lens of complicity enables us, first, to expose and subsequently to analyze the misconduct of all those who, in their various capacities and through their various actions and omissions, made possible the Iraq War and the many cruelties that came with it and in its aftermath. The understanding of complicity introduced here is very broad. Does this imply that we live in a world of sinners, where all are to blame? Are we, both editors and contributors, guilty of constructing a concept so broad that it loses any meaning, let alone meaningfulness? Aaron's suggestion, after introducing complicity 9. All, is that where all are guilty, Nobody is point eleven. Many contributors to this volume, me, however, suggest that the value of the notion of complicity does not wholly depend on its capacity to hand out sentences to individuals. G. Juliana Monteverdi, for example, argues in Navigating Complicity in Contemporary Feminist Discourse that, in some cases, complicity is understandable and unavoidable. Allowing for a broader concept of complicity can help us identify structures of oppression, including the oppression of thought 12 and to reflect on how these structures come about. It also allows us to reflect on how their coming about could be prevented. In exposing and critically analyzing structures within which one cannot help but be complicit, this collection thus expands the notion of complicity without adopting a secularized version of the Catholic belief, explored in Marika Rose's chapter, that people are sinners. By virtue of having been born into a world of sin. Much as attributing blame. To certain individuals cannot be the only point of thinking about complicity, so it also cannot be the case that all of us are to be blamed for everything all the time. To think otherwise would, ironically, be to fall into the trap of an atomistic understanding of complicity, and of much else. This project is not primarily about pointing fingers, on the contrary, understanding complicity in its broader social and structural dimension reveals that not everyone becomes susceptible to blame, let alone condemnation, on the basis of what they do or fail to do. As Pam Leadman points out with reference to the operating mechanisms of the National Health Service, NHS, in England, people might sometimes simply be lost within a world of structural myths. Seeing complicity as a structural phenomenon highlights the limitations of turning individual moral agency into the sole object of epistemic and norma. Tip concern, and thus to run the risk of being blind to the existential disease. Cities, social structures, historical and political contexts, as well as group dynamics and regimes of language, as Daugherty puts it, that constrain or at times obliterate our ability to not be complicit. If we acknowledge ourselves as interwoven within complex structures of complicities, we might be in a better position to recognize our responsibility to be attentive to the harm being caused, and to the ways in which we might be involved in producing and reproducing harm. We might then become more sensitive to the complex ways in which we are interconnected and involved, not so much in doing wrong, but in wrong being done. Conversely, however, we do not intend to let people disavow their responsibility by pointing to the structural determinants of their complicity. Agents can work towards overcoming structures of oppression, and it is incumbent upon them to do so, particularly if they are in a position of power and privilege. As Marx famously observed, people make their own history, but they do not make it as they please, they do not make it under self-selected circumstances, 
but under circumstances existing already. Point 13 Adopting this broader notion of complicity, furthermore, allows us 10 of sentence of sensu et al. to make crucial distinctions between the different agents involved, rather than requiring us to tar everyone with the same brush. Complicity clearly comes in different degrees and in different kinds, as Daniel Conway writes in Shades of White Complicity. While some who are complicit are blameworthy, if only by virtue of being culpably ignorant, or perhaps even intentionally ignorant, as Conway suggests, others might not be. The story of complicity is a complicated one. Thus expanding complicity beyond its atomistic horizon neither serves to render everyone guilty, nor tramples over important distinctions between degrees and kinds of complicity. Instead, it allows us to use the notion to argue that some structures of complicity should not be allowed to run their natural course. They should be, and can be, resisted. Effective resistance, however, cannot be launched by structurally ensnared yet deeply remorse. Full individual accomplices alone, it needs to be collective. What form such? Resistance has to take is not for us to prescribe. All we want to suggest is that looking at complicity structurally might equip us with a kind of normative guidance difficult to reject, to aim for a world in which people are no longer forced to be complicit in wrongdoing merely by virtue of being structurally positioned so as not to be able to avoid it. To go back to our voter example, the aim should be to resist a state of affairs in which the voter's dilemma of having to choose between aiding and abetting militarism in different ways continues to arise. The assumption that we can walk through life without ever becoming complicit has turned out to be an illusion. We cannot always choose not to be complicit in wrongdoing, and especially not if the we in question is built upon a bloody edifice of privilege and repression, a point Marika Rose makes in relation to the we of Western, liberal citizens. Point 14 in fact, are very conforming to the rules, our unexamined obedience to the laws of the land. Our tacit compliance with past, present and future wrongdoing, might be precisely what renders us complicit. Perhaps the only way to avoid being so would be to question the rules and challenge the law. If the structural perspective introduced above has some purchase, then the picture of the law-abiding, non-complicit citizen model is effectively reversed, we cannot walk through life without being complicit. This does not mean that we always know, that we are always blameworthy, that we could always do otherwise. Rather, it means that we have a responsibility in our capacity as critical agents to think through the complexities of our various complicities in wrongdoing as well as we can, and to oppose complicity both individually and in collaboration with others. There is no teleology involved in this normative claim, no abstract blueprint for a better world. Rather, it is a call to refuse to take the makeup of given social arrangements as inevitable. What complicity, as thus conceptualized, invokes is ultimately a demand for recognizing the ways in introducing complicity 11, which people are connected both to one another and to the non-human world, a demand to be critically attentive on complicity and resistance, complicity dilemmas and anti-complicity. One of the things suggested in the following chapters is, to reiterate, that there can be dilemmas of complicity, situations in which, for contingent REA sons beyond one's control, one cannot help but be complicit in the doing of wrong, regardless of what one does, or does not, do point 15 such as, according to Cornelia Wachter, the situation of Millie, the widow of the successful black Scottish jazz trumpeter Joss Moody who is posthumously outed as an Cali female. Moral agents cannot always avoid being complicit, particularly not through withdrawal from public life. Individual non-complicity is often nothing but another form of complicity, complicity through omission and in disguise. Individuals who try to avoid being complicit by living the distant life of a hermit tend to be concerned primarily with their own purity in a world of pain, rather than with the pain itself. Calling for the avoidance of complicity in this way is nothing more than a secular restatement of the Christian rhetoric of achieving absolution from sin. Avoiding complicity by completely withdrawing from all social interactions that connect one to wrongdoing, even if this were possible, would thus itself be problematic at best. One cannot, we argue, confront the political problem of complicity by taking an apolitical turn. Given that non-complicity is not, and probably never will be, an option, it may instead be best to resist actively the most damaging practices and relations in which one is forced to be complicit. This would involve collective and individual forms of anti-complicity. Being anti-complicit is not about preserving one's purity, an exercise which only the materially privileged tend to have sufficient time and resources to engage in, it is a commitment to understanding and resisting structures that cause harm. Anti-complicity is not about exculpation, but about solidarity and transformation. To be non-complicit is an exercise in self-defensive psychology, the aim is to avoid blame. To be anti-complicit is to be defiant, in collaboration with others, in the face of structural wrongdoing. This understanding of complicity and anti-complicity is concerned with the world at large as much as it is with individual blameworthiness. It does not attribute a particular kind of normative significance to boundaries, such as state boundaries, which serve as instruments of a legitimate differential distribution of harm, and of redescribing instances of wrongdoing as legitimate pursuits of self-interest. It also cuts across multiple ways of being subjected. 12 of sentence of sensu et al. To such harm. People can be complicit in all sorts of things that, in a less horrific world, would be less overwhelmingly present, things such as killing, torturing and exploiting people, causing them physical or psychological pain, and irrationally discriminating against them. Complicity offers a vision of harm that is unifying but not totalizing. It covers all sorts of experiences of harm, and it does so without epistemic discrimination in favor of the kind of harm that defenders of liberal conceptions of violence are narrowly concerned with, 
harm caused by direct blows against life, liberty, and property, something committed by identifiable criminals, breakers of laws. This, then, is what complicity as a heuristic tool does, it broadens our horizons as to what constitutes harm being done. It makes us more alert to the implicit harms constituted within structures of oppression, and to the ways in which these structures cannot be upheld other than through an indefinite number of acts of complicity, committed by a multitude of agents, ignorant and non-ignorant, culpable and non-culpable, powerful and powerless. Many of these acts of complicity will be entirely trivial and mundane, others will not be. We need to think critically about both. Reflection on complicity might make us more attentive to the structures of wrongdoing that will continue existing in different ways, unperturbedly, unless we do something about them here and now. We might never even begin to do that of course. More likely, we will keep persuading ourselves that things are progressing, that the rest just needs to join the West, and so on, and we will continue to engage in such reflections while the world is literally disintegrating and collapsing around us. But perhaps we can begin to act more responsibly. If this volume makes a contribution to that end, as an exercise in anti-complicity by its authors and editors, it has fulfilled a useful purpose. Notes. 1. We thank Bob Brecker for his, as ever, invaluable comments on an earlier draft. 2. We are thus not interested in basing our analysis on the etymology or legal definition of the term. 3. There are also forms of complicity in writing and in academic inquiry more broadly. 4. Critical analyses of such complicities, see, for instance, Brecker and News Chapter in this volume, Robin Dunford, Peasant Activism and the Rise of Food Sovereignty, Decolonizing and Democratizing Norm Diffusion. European Journal of International Relations, published online before print, 2015, accessed July 5, 2016 http slash slash edge dot sage pub dot com slash content slash early slash twenty fifteen slash eleven slash zero four slash one three five four zero six six one one five six one four three eight two dot abstract http slash slash edge dot sage pub dot com slash content slash early slash twenty fifteen slash eleven slash zero four slash one three five four zero six six one one five six one four three eight two dot abstract and Michael New, The Tragedy of Justified War, International Relations twenty seven, two thousand and thirteen four hundred and sixty one to eighty. Introducing complicity thirteen. Four C, for example, John Gardner, Review of Complicity, Ethics and Law for a Collective Age, by Christopher Cutts, Ethics 114, 2004 827 30, John Gardner, Complicity and Causality, Criminal Law and Philosophy 1, 2007 127 41, Kiara Lepra and Robert E. Gooden, On Complicity and Compromise, Oxford, Oxford University Press, 2013, Brian Lawson, Individual Complicity in Collective Wrongdoing, Ethical Theory and Moral Practice 16, 2013 227 43, and C.M. Miller, Collective Moral Responsibility, an Individualist Account, Midwest Studies in Philosophy 30, 2006 176 93. 5. Ibid, Original Emphasis. 6. Christopher Cutts develops a participatory conception of accountability in complicity, ethics and law for a collective age, Cambridge, Cambridge University Press, 2007. 7. At the infamous German Green Party Convention in Bielefeld in 1999, a major ITY of party members, led by the then German Foreign Minister Jischke Fischer, voted against an indefinite ceasefire. Someone threw a red paint bomb at Fischer, which hit him hard and splashed. For a five-second video that captures the moment, see https colon slash slash www.youtube.com slash watch v equals 724 ygz slash watch v equals 724 ygz accessed June 27, 2016. A for an excellent analysis of how the war on terrorism has been manufactured, see Richard Jackson, writing The War on Terror, Language, Politics, and Counterterrorism, Manchester, Manchester University Press, 2005. 9. Kiara Lepra and Robert Gooden take this approach in their analysis of complicity in the context of humanitarian aid work. See Lepra and Gooden, on Complic ITY and Compromise. See also Endnote 15 below. 10. Also see Thomas Docherty, Complicity, Criticism Between Collaboration and Commitment, London, Roman and Littlefield International, 2016, and Michael New, Just Liberal Violence, Sweatshops, Torture, War, London, Roman and Littlefield International, forthcoming. 11. Hannah Arendt, Collective Responsibility, In Responsibility and Judgment. Ed. Jerome Cohn, New York, Shock and Books, 2003, 147. 12. One might be reminded here of Alastair McIntyre's imperative, always ask about your own social and cultural order what it needs you and others not to know has become an indispensable moral maxim. Alastair McIntyre, Social Structures and Their Threats to Moral Agency, Philosophy 74, 1999 319. 13. Karl Marx, The 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, 1852, accessed July 3, 2016, https slash slash www.marxists.org slash archive slash mark slash work slash 1852 slash 18 th Brumaire slash https slash slash www.marxists.org slash archive slash mark slash work slash 1852 slash 18 th Brumaire slash ch01.htm ch01.htm. See also Robin Dunford, The Politics of Transnational Peasant Struggle, Resistance, 
Rights, Democracy, London, Roman and Littlefield International, 2016. 14. Both editors and authors are aware of our positionality as citizens in Western, liberal democratic states. As such, our reflections often focus on the actions, or indeed omissions, of politicians, citizens, and others in such states. It may be that some of the most damaging structural forms of complicity arise from one's being geopolitically positioned on the privileged side of various international or global hierarchies, in the sense that such citizens are likely to be complicit in the reproduction of hierarchies that generate enormous suffering. This does not mean, however, that the concept would be useless elsewhere. We leave open the relevance of these reflections. 14 of Centus of Sensu et al. On complicity to those in other positions. Indeed, one of the virtues of the approach to complicity developed through this book is that it does not suggest that complicity must take one fixed and rigid form in all contexts and circumstances. Instead, it suggests that the notion of complicity can be put to critical use in a diversity of contexts and by people in different geopolitical positions. 15 Lepra and Gooden talk about humanitarian conundrums, which arise when an agent is inevitably involved in a complicit act. We want to distance our term complicity dilemmas from their humanitarian conundrums. For them, the inevitability of being complicit in one type of wrongdoing over another ultimately functions as a moral absolvent. Consider how they approach the topic of humanitarian conundrums, was it nonetheless the right thing to do, on balance? The answer to that question will be a function of how much bad was done by the act of complicity, compared to how bad would have been the alternative courses of action available to the agent. We do not expect the notion of complicity dilemmas to operate in this way. Complicity dilemma is not a term intended to facilitate justifying, either partly, or fully, a complicit act when it causes a lesser evil rather than a greater evil. On the contrary, the term complicity dilemma problematizes the very condition of someone being complicit, and having no alternative but to be complicit, in wrongdoing. As such, was it nonetheless the right thing to do? on balance, is a misleading question to ask. It presupposes that such complicit acts can be right, a presupposition which is itself based on the validity of a utilitarian moral calculus. It is a question that can easily lead into a depiction of the complicit act as morally necessary when it is taken in order to achieve some greater good. In the final analysis, the concept of humanity and conundrum surrenders to complicity, rather than offering resistance to it. Lepra and Gooden, on complicity and compromise, 4-7. Bibliography. Arendt, Hannah. Collective Responsibility. In Responsibility and Judgment. Edited by Jerome Cohn. New York, Shock and Books, 2003. Daugherty, Thomas. Complicity, Criticism Between Collaboration and Commitment. London, Roman and Littlefield International, 2016. Robin Dunford, Peasant Activism and the Rise of Food Sovereignty, Decolonizing and Democratizing Norm Diffusion. European Journal of International Relations. Published online before print, 2015. Access July 5, 2016 http slash slash edge dot sage pub dot com slash content slash early slash twenty fifteen slash eleven slash zero four slash one three five four zero six six one one five six one four three eight two dot abstract slash slash edge dot sage pub dot com slash content slash early slash twenty fifteen slash eleven slash zero four slash one three five four zero